Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm here with Eleanor. Um, we wish we could do it in person and see everybody. Um, but this is the next best thing. I guess the advantage is that we can reach people from uh, further afield. Um, so as I said in my email, um, we just ask that you uh, keep your microphone muted and also um, your video turned off. I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see this. So we just, like I said, uh, we asked everybody to just keep their microphone muted and their video off um, for, so that things will run smoothly and just save your questions till the end, but I look forward to hearing your questions. Um, so here we go. So thanks again for joining us. Um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, grassland restoration, wildflower meadows um, and Piedmont prairies. So first I'll give a very brief intro about the Clifton Institute because there are some names I haven't seen before. Well, we're glad to see some new folks just to let you know a little bit more about Clifton. Um, then I'm gonna uh, talk about my personal meadow project. It's gonna be, uh, this talk is gonna be kind of like a personal journey. So starting out on my small property and then moving to Clifton um, and on a beer scale uh, restoration project. And then finally uh, talking about Piedmont Prairies at the end. So the Clifton Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have four full-time staff um, and we are funded primarily by individual donations and donation grants. And our three program areas are education, restoration, and research. Our mission is to inspire the next generation of environmental stewards to learn about the ecology of the North, Northern Virginia Piedmont and to conserve native biodiversity. And we're located on a 900 acre property just north of Warrington in Fauquier County, which is protected by a conservation easement. So this shows the location of the Clifton Institute. Um, for this further field, we're about an hour west of Washington, D.C. in the people. And so our education programs, um, in 2019, we had nearly 1,600 kids come through uh, the Clifton Institute. Um, they come on field trips. Uh, through with the schools. They also come on Piedmont Hollywalk programs uh, for pre-K. We do Yikes, a monthly youth hike Saturday for uh, six to 12 year olds. We're starting a middle school nature club that's been disrupted a little bit by the coronavirus, but that's one of our new projects. Uh, we also do programs for homeschoolers and we have three different summer camps, which we are still hoping to run this summer. Um, so pre-K Hollywalk's camp, uh, young Explorers Camp for the seven to 12 year olds and Young Scientists Camp, and that's uh, for high schoolers. And the idea behind that camp is that you spend the first day coming up with a research question, and then you go out and uh, with the student and collect data for the next couple of days. And then you analyze the data and present the results all within one week. So it's like a crash course in research uh, for high schoolers. We're still looking for students for that. So if you know anybody, let us know. And here are some photos of our education programs. Um, so like in the bottom left, the, the kids are collecting data on insects that are found in our native plant garden. Um, we do always do a hike with our programs. And in the bottom right, this is an example of one of our activities where we're um, looking at seed dispersal. We're putting seeds in front of a fan and seeing how far they go. That's a good way to get the kids thinking about seed dispersal. And for adults, um, what's happening? Should I speak more slowly? Or? All right, so I've heard we've had some technical difficulties. Let me look at see if I see the chat. Well, Eleanor, can you tell me, is that better? Sounds better. Yeah. Okay. If you are having trouble hearing me, just um, talk to us on the chat and Eleanor can tell me and I'll try something else. Um, Okay, so back to uh, public programs. So we do all sorts of programs uh, for adults from really specialized things like beetle programs to um, yoga and nature. So all, a whole spectrum of things. And now we're switching completely to remote programs. So um, Eleanor will be giving a talk on species evolution next week. 
definitely recommend that. And we have a new YouTube channel where we're putting up videos on natural history and, and environmental education programs uh, for parents. Okay, so now on to my meadow project. So Eleanor and I moved uh, to this area about five years ago and um, we bought a five acre property, which included a one acre field in the back and that's shown in this photo, um, which I was interested, I, I didn't want to mow it, you know, the previous owner had mowed it really frequently and I was interested in trying to make wildlife habitat out of it. Uh, but if you see this photo here, um, tell it's um, an old fescue field. So it's dominated by tall fescue and orchard grass, which are exotic grasses. Um, and there was a little bit of purple top and little blue stem, which are some native grasses, but there were basically no flowers or pollinators. And if you look in the map that shows where my house is about 20 minutes southwest of Clifton there. So before I go much further, I wanted to give you a quick tutorial on the grasses. Um, so I am a bird guy, I trained as a bird guy, and um, that's how it all got started with me. But I'm getting more and more into plants, and I know that for me, grasses were the, some of the most intimidating uh, plants to learn. But um, luckily, you don't actually have to know that many grasses, so I think um, just the most common ones will get you through. And if you learn these, these are great examples um, of our common native grasses, so purple top, broom sedge, little blue stem and Indian grass. Um, and Northern Piedmont prairies, so the prairies in our part of Northern Virginia are dominated by little blue stem and Indian grass. So if you already have either of those grasses on your property, that's a, that's a really good sign. Um, and in contrast, the cool season pasture grasses um, that we have a lot of are tall fescue and orchard grass. Um, and if you look at this, um, let's see here. You look at this image, it just kind of shows you the difference at a glance. So um, the, the, mostly what we have in this image is fescue, and this is in the winter. So in the winter, tall fescue just flops over and provides very little cover for uh, wildlife like quail or turkeys. But then if you look in the top left, um, that shows some Indian grass, which is still standing tall, um, providing good um, habitat. And also if we get any snow, the fescue seeds are covered immediately. Um, whereas the natives are, are standing above the snow. So and let me go back quickly to this. So um, just thinking about the difference between cool season and warm season grasses. So the cool season grasses like tall fescue and orchard grass um, are exotic. So the exotic grasses tend to be the cool season grasses that grow mainly in the spring and in the fall. Um, the native grasses mostly grow in the summer. And so if you're thinking how can I um, convert my pasture or how can I uh, promote natives at the expense of exotics. Um, the spring and the late fall are a good time to do that. So for example, you can spray herbicide in November after a couple of frosts and kill the exotics without hurting the natives. Okay, and so why are we so obsessed with native plants? Um, you probably heard that exotics are bad um, and natives are good, but there actually are some really good data behind this. Um, so Doug Tellamy and his team at the University of Delaware have collected a lot of information on categories in native, uh, on native plants and on exotic plants. And if you look at these three graphs, it, it shows that there are more species and more caterpillars by far found on a native hedgerow than on an exotic hedgerow. Um, so this is comparing autumn olive um, to native plants, basically. And you can see um, that there's a huge decline in caterpillar biomass in an autumn olive hedgerow. And this is bad, obviously, for the moths and butterflies, but it's also a big problem for our native birds. And the average songbird requires 3,000 caterpillars um, to fledge out of the nest. So this is uh, why we are really into natives. And of course, the native plants themselves also need a place to live. Okay, so the goals of my meadow project to, at my property, um, number one, I wanted to have pretty flowers, like this smooth blue aster. I think everybody likes pretty flowers. Secondly, I was interested in providing habitat for pollinators. Thirdly, I would be uh, happy to provide habitat for grassland birds, like grasshopper sparrows, and shrubland birds, like prairie warblers. 
that was not possible because I'm dealing with one acre. So, so I think it's important to, um, you know, think about your goals and realize what's possible and what's not on your piece of land. That's, that's a key first step. But I am, you know, able to provide some important habitat even on one acre. So this is a picture of a Bombus pensylvanicus, the American bumblebee, which is one of our um, uncommon and probably declining uh, bumblebees in our area. And they are now uh, found in my backfield, my one acre field. So that's, that's success, I think. Okay, so the step-by-step -step on my meadow project. The first step was to do a plant inventory. I did a quick one and I was still learning my plants, so that wasn't the greatest. Um, but I still tried to target the exotics and leave the, the broom's edge and the little blue stuff. So my next step was spraying Roundup three times on a third of the field in order to kill the fescue and the orchard grass. Then I disturbed the soil slightly with a rake um, to give the seeds a bit more purchase. Then I broadcast seeds of 27 wildflower species that are native to the county. And then I rolled um, the area with a lawn roller. That's to get better seed to soil contact. So by doing that, you're making sure the seeds are down deep enough. But with the natives, you really don't want them to be very deep. So putting them on the surface and rolling them is a, is a good way of doing that. And then in addition, we planted about 100 seedlings of uh, species that don't come up very well from seed. Um, and uh, that was a pretty good tactic as well, I think. And this is the result. So um, this was last summer. You can see some narrow leaf mountain mint, some wild bergamot. Um, uh, so it worked out really well. So we have quite a few flowers, really nice covered in pollinators. So that was, that was good. But then other areas, of course, uh, in the field are not so good. So joint head grass, Arthraxon hispidus, and Japanese stillgrass, which probably everybody knows, are both big problems on my personal property. Um, so by taking out the fescue, it opened up a huge opportunity for these annual grasses. So it actually turns out, you know, fescue gets a lot of attention, but these annuals are, it seems to be actually a bigger problem to deal with. Okay, lessons from my meadow project. So by using herbicides in a, what I would call a judicious way, we were able to kill the exotics, um, at least the exotic perennials, without disturbing the soil. And so we didn't expose a lot of uh, weed seeds from the seed bank. I seeded only wildflowers um, because I heard from several people that the grasses will move in on their own. That uh, remains to be seen. So we're now about four years in and that hasn't happened yet, but um, hopefully some of those grasses will make their way in like the system. And if they don't, we can, we can put down some seeds for them too. In general, there's no need for fertilizer, lime, or watering in these projects. Um, if you do any of those, it tends to give an advantage to the weeds that actually, to the exotics that need more nutrients and moisture basic soil. So as I alluded to, my inventory could have been better. Um, There's some nice plants there around the edges of the field that I hadn't noticed and, and luckily I didn't spray them. Um, but sometimes this happens so you know um, and I, I can see how it would happen. Um, often people are trying to do the right thing and they end up uh, spraying herbicide and killing some of the good stuff and then they plant a seed mix on top of that which actually could end up being a so I think it's, it's really important to do a good inventory. Um, and if you don't have the botanical expertise to do it, then get in touch with somebody who can help. You know, uh, Virginia Working Landscapes, Virginia Native Plant Society, Clifton Institute, um, we can all uh, give you a hand with these sorts of projects. Another thing I could have done with my personal uh, meadow was like, could have tried a spray and leaf treatment. So I already talked a little bit about this. Uh, for example, in November, you can spray the fescue and then just see what comes up. And that's cheaper and maybe better if you have a lot of good plants in the native uh, in the seed bank. Although at my property, that doesn't seem to really be the case. Okay, but what should we plant? Um, it's the position of the Clifton Institute that we should try to always plant things that are native to your county when you're putting in wildflower meadows. Um, and I'll explain a bit more why we have that position. Um, and, but to get that information, you can go to the Virginia Native Plant Atlas, and that address is below there, to find out what species are found in your county. 
And so this is a scaly blazing star. This is a beautiful Piedmont prairie plant. You can see its distribution is pretty much only in the Piedmont um, and it's found in grassland. So this is a characteristic Piedmont prairie plant. Um, and we can get that information from the native plant atlas. So um, we worked with Virginia Working Landscapes and with uh, Virginia DCR to come up with a recommended list of species to plant in meadows in our region. So it ends at that address below. Um, so that's a starting place if, you, if you'd like to use species that, are, um, that belong uh, in your area. Um, and then once you have a list of species, the trick is to find out how many pounds of each species you need to do your planting. And you can uh, work on that uh, by getting in touch with the private lands biologists. Uh, they have a calculator to find, to, so you can uh, calculate how many, speed, how many pounds per acre you need of each species. And you can also send me an email and I can help you out with that. As you can imagine, um, the key is to not plant too much. So there have been a lot of examples where people have planted too many seeds, they got a little bit too excited and they wanted to make sure they um, crowded out the exotics. And it can actually um, end up being an impenetrable habitat that's not that great for wildlife. So it's important to plant um, the appropriate amount of seeds. Okay, but do they all really have to be native to Virginia? Um, so I'm kind of a purist on this and um, when I'm doing restoration projects or when I'm planting wildflower meadows, I try to use things that belong in that habitat. But around my house, I do, you know, I have, um, we're converting it to all things that are native to North America, but we're actually using a few things that are not even native to Virginia because they're such magnets for pollinators and they're just really nice things to have around your house. So it really depends on what your goals are and where you're doing these projects. Um, so I'm showing the Indian blanket here, which is one that's still commonly planted in um, so-called native, you know, projects, um, meadow projects in our area but it's actually native to the Southwest. So it's actually, it's not really found near here, naturally anywhere near Virginia. Um, and that can be a problem because of specialist insects. So I'm gonna talk more about that later, um, but a lot of our bees can only uh, collect pollen from a couple of different kinds of plants. So if you're planting something weird, that may not fulfill the needs of our pollinators. Um, but if you're in the situation where you have, um, your neighbors are not really on board with the natives and um, you're trying to convert them, you may need to make some sacrifices for beauty, you know? And so if you're looking, you know, if they have something they really want and it's not native to the county, then go for it. It's gonna be a lot better than having miscanthus or some exotic um, uh, ornamental. Um, and one note for, if you wanna create habitat for grassland birds, I would suggest you use short species. Um, so a lot of times people will plant tall wildflower meadows, which, you know, a lot of these plants are tall and you have to be careful to try to, if you want to do a short grass um, area. And things like grasshopper sparrows and meadowlarks want short grass. So I mentioned the specialist insects and pollen. Um, so a lot of the pollinators that we're trying to attract, like butterflies and uh, bees and hoverflies, are going for nectar and nectar is really important um, but the bees require pollen so female bees are going out there to collect pollen so that they can raise their offspring with that pollen. and as i said a lot of them are specialists so a lot of them for example can only get pollen from goldenrod um, so if you're planting a bunch of showy things from the midwestern u.s and there's no goldenrod that could be a problem um, but you know we're all working really hard and trying to do the right thing here and i'm not trying to criticize but um, we just need to think about what we're doing. So, and this is a photo of a, a big project near us where they went to great expense to plant some really great stuff. Um, but are they, are we actually accomplishing the goal that we think we're accomplishing? And this is still an open question in terms of pollen. Um, but Dave Carr and his colleagues from Blandy have been working on this. Um, so this is a little bit complicated, but basically we have uh, three pie charts, which are three different properties. And those slices are different kinds of plants. And so the big brown slices are unknown and the big light blue are horse nettle. So you can see that the bumblebees at these three properties are getting a lot of their pollen from horse nettle. And you probably know that plant, it's a spiky plant in the tomato family. Most people consider it to be a, a weed, a noxious weed. Um, livestock don't like it. and People are usually trying to get rid of horse nettle. Um, 
but it is native and it is providing a lot of pollen. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and I didn't mention these three properties have all worked really hard to plant wildflower meadows. They were not planting horse nettle, that's for sure. Um, then you see the orange slices are crown vetch. Crown vetch is a noxious weed. It's an exotic one that we're trying to get rid of, but it is um, providing pollen to the bees in these meadows that have been planted. So that's interesting. And then finally, you can see in the dark blue slice with the arrow, wild bergamot um, did provide a little bit of pollen at one of these properties. And that's a native and that's one that we're all planting. And it's a real, it's a magnet for bees going in and getting um, nectar. But at least at the re these three properties, these wildflower meadows, it was not an important source of pollen. Um, so again, not trying to criticize anybody, but it's just something we need to remember. Are we, are we meeting those objectives that we're seeking out to, to achieve? And this is, this is brand new research that Dave Carr has done and we're, um, he's, I'm sure gonna keep uncovering more so that we'll learn more about this in the future. Okay, but once I plant my meadow, how do I manage it? Um, there are three main ways, mowing, burning, and grazing. Um, mowing, at least in our region, is the default. Um, if you have a riding mower um, or a bush hog, it's pretty easy to go out and mow your field once a year and keep it as a field. Of course, if you don't do that, it'll turn into forest pretty fast. Uh, here. Um, burning is another good option and a little bit, obviously, more complicated logistically. Um, but we use burning at the Clifton Institute and at my personal property um, because it should promote the native plants. So historically, these grasslands were maintained by fire, so the native plants tend to be adapted to fire, whereas the exotics um, are sensitive to fire. So the top right picture is a photo of our personal property. And this is the first burn I ever did. And you can see it was pretty easy going. The flames are like about a foot tall, um, and that was a, a good first burn. And it worked really well. And I talked to the neighbors and they were all fine with it. And uh, we did this ourselves. And so um, I've taken the prescribed burn manager class. So I'm certified to do this. Um, and I did it with uh, experienced people who had done it before and who had all the necessary equipment. But this can be achieved if you're interested in doing your own burns, it is possible. And you can work with people in your area who know what they're doing. Um, we're also doing it now at the Clipson Institute on a larger scale. So the bottom right photo uh, shows one of our burns that we did this year. That was a 15, that was a, that was a four acre burn, but we've done 15 acres total this year um, at Clifton. And then grazing is also an option. Um, and in terms of trying to promote native species, uh, grazing cattle um, could mimic uh, the way that bison disturb the landscape and um, presumably would benefit flowers over grasses. Okay, so from my meadow project to Clifton. So um, when the, the job of executive director of the Clifton Institute popped up, I was immediately interested. I was working across the street at another conservation organization, but I had known about Clifton um, and found out that they had a 200 acre pasture that was currently a pesky pasture but it had huge potential for creating native grasslands. And so I got really excited about that. So, um, this is what the pasture looked like um, when we first got started. You can see that's pretty much all tall pesky. So before we got started, um, I wanted to learn about the history of this property and the, especially the pasture. And the yellow outline shows the rough property line of Clifton, where the red line shows the pasture current pasture boundary. And this is a, an aerial photo from 1937. So you can see that in 1937, it was pretty much all pasture, probably a cattle pasture. You can also see orchards and um, other things that are now long gone up on top of the mountain, which is interesting. But the point is that this has been a big grassland for a long time. You can also see that on three sides of the property are other grasslands. And that's still the case now. We have um, a couple thousand acres of cattle pastures in the neighborhood. So, so that's good. I mean, so that gives us the potential to create a functioning uh, native grassland here. So I mentioned um, there were cows on it when we started. So there were cows on both sides of the field. This uh, map is showing the 200 acre pasture with the fence in the middle. 
Um, but one of our first actions was to remove cattle from the southern pasture, which is 110 acres. And then we began to find out what we had in terms of plants and animals in that pasture. So we worked with the Native Plant Society um, and with other collaborators to do plant and animal surveys in the southern pasture. And we did five different plant surveys in the, the summer of 2018, spring and summer of 2018. Um, we found about 160 species of plants and it was a real mix. Um, so we had some really good stuff like little, um, like narrow leaf mountain mint and little blue stem. Um, and we had a bunch of bad stuff as well, of course, lots of but other things that are going to cause trouble for us, like musk thistle. So good and bad, a real mix. And if you look, um, so this is a graph showing how plant diversity changes over time in the pasture. You can see that in May, we started out with more exotic species than natives. And as the season progressed, there ended up being more native species than exotics. And you might look at this and say, well, it's a fescue field and everybody's saying it's a fescue field and you just got to go kill it all. Um, and so you may have a lot of native species, but it's still going to be dominated by fescue. But if we weight it by abundance, if you actually um, take that into account, we see that no, actually, there it's still almost all natives um, later in the season. So that's interesting. So there, you know, there seems to be something to save, something worth saving out there. And then we worked with Virginia Working Landscapes and with Blandy again um, to do bumblebee surveys. And we found a whole bunch of bumblebees out there. So it's actually this is really good news. I mean, it, we were surprised to find such a diversity and abundance of bumblebees, including four species that are either uncommon or declining. And this is at the moment just considered a, a fescue field, again, um, that is thought to be, you know, not very valuable. So given the mix of natives and exotics, we are trying a whole bunch of different ways um, to try to give the natives a leg up. Um, and so we're trying eight different treatments. We are uh, comparing mowing and burning. We are trying a release spray treatment, like I talked about, um, one spray of herbicide and nothing else just to release the native seed mix. We're also doing this standard spray three times and plant a native seed mix. And we're doing an organic method, which is repeated disking and planting seed. So again, in the northern pasture, we have cattle, and in the southern is this 110 acre project. So if you zoom in on the southern pasture, uh, one of the first things we did was to plant um, 250 trees in the future riparian buffer area. And we're gonna be expanding this in the future with support from NRCS. Then we have two control plots. And so on the right side of the slide, you can see um, we have establishment and management methods. Um, so the establishment method for the control is nothing. We don't do anything. But for management to keep it as a field, we bush hog half and we burn half. So this is mowing over here and this is burning. Then we have the spray and leave treatment that I was talking about. So we spray, we did this uh, last November after about three frosts and we sprayed in November to kill the fescue and release the seed bank, hopefully to let the natives uh, take hold. And then we burn half, the left half, to maintain it as a field and we mow the right half. And for the seed bank, before I go on to the other experimental treatments, I just wanted to show you um, some new results that we have on the seed bank. We worked with a student from Fauquier High School to collect soil samples from 14 different sites in the field to find out what is out there in terms of the seed bank. And then we um, removed all the roots so we didn't have any uh, bud sprouts and um, we germinated them in the greenhouse and controlled the environment to find out what we got in the seed bank. And if you look at the graph, we have um, a lot of unidentified species so far, mostly un unidentified grasses and sedges, which we don't know if they're going to be native or exotic because we they still have a ways to go. Um, they're still really little. But you can see so far, unfortunately, the exotics are doing better than the natives. So we have quite a few um, exotics, including a lot of arthraxon, that joint, the joint head grass, and also um, Persicaria longicida, which is another really nasty exotic. So unfortunately, so far, it looks like the spray and leave might not be the best solution here. And that is a, that's a bit of a disappointment because um, it sure is cheaper than planting seeds. And you also use one third of herbicide. Um, but so we'll see, that we'll see what happens. Okay, and back to the treatment. So um, uh, 
Third treatment is spraying three times and planting seed mix. So that's shown in green. And then we mow half and we burn the other half. And finally, we have the organic treatment. And this is repeated disking, which is like plowing um, to churn up the fescue and other exotics to kill the exotics by plowing them under repeatedly. So plowing them six times, planting cover crops in between to smother out the exotics, and finally planting a mix of natives. So we're really fortunate to be working with collaborators at Virginia Working Landscapes and the Oak Spring Garden Foundation to replicate this experiment at two other sites in our region. Um, and we're also working with them um, on collecting data on the, the plants and animals at these sites so that we can measure our success. So if you wanna try um, putting in a meadow on a, a larger property, so I started out at my personal property at one acre, um, and the methods I use there are, are not practical at scale. And so when you're trying to do 100 acres, this is a standard uh, treatment, which is advised by NRCS. Um, so the first thing to do is to mow the field. Um, then you let the fescue recover uh, to be about six inches tall. Then you spray it in November. Then you let all the weeds grow up again and you spray them the following summer um, to kill the bad stuff. Then you plant a cover crop to prevent erosion. And then finally you do a spray in the following spring and then you plant your native seed mix. Um, so this is what we're gonna be doing, you know, on a third of our experiment. Um, and we're gonna be using a native seed drill for this, which is the ideal tool if you can find access to one. Because it plants the seeds at the right depth and it can deal with the big flood. And here's a possible organic alternative. This is the method that we're using. There are other possibilities for organics, but um, for example, spraying uh, or putting down sulfur to try to make the soil more acidic. That's one option. But we're trying the disking option. Um, and so, like I said, it's about six times. So we, we plowed last fall. We're gonna disk this month. We're gonna disk again this summer and then plant a cover crop to smother out the weeds. Um, then in the fall, we disk it again and plant a winter cover crop for erosion control. And then finally, next spring, we disc and then we cultivate, which basically packs the soil, um, and then plant the natives on top of that. And this hasn't been tried that many times in Virginia, um, but this is one example, and you can see it worked really well um, in this case, and we're hoping that it'll work well here too. I mean, with all these projects, organic or conventional, um, every site is different, the soils are different, the history of the, the land use is different, the species present, the good species, and the bad species present are different. And so you'll see um, as you get more into this that there's a ton of variation and you never know what the next year is going to bring, even on your even on one property. So and just thinking about the pros and cons of organic versus conventional. Um, obviously the pro of organic is no chemicals used and, and we don't want to use any more chemicals than we have to by any means. There are potential, a lot of potential problems from herbicides, um, but there are also some cons of organic. So for one thing, it's gonna cost probably about three times as much to do it. So three, three times as much per acre. More fossil fuel is used, question mark. Maybe, maybe not. Um, so we're tracking um, how much diesel we're using and we're tracking how much money we spend. So we'll find out what the answer is, at least on our property for that. The soil disturbance from our method could be bad um, for ground nesting bees and soil microbes, as well as water quality, and it could release greenhouse gases. Um, herbicides, of course, as I mentioned, have a lot of problems. Um, there are ways to minimize those problems, but there are some you know, that are unavoidable, like killing non-target plants. Um, and it could be affecting the soil microbes too. So we're tracking all this and we're gonna, um, again, we're not taking sides here, but we're just trying to collect data on the practicality of the economics and the outcome, how successful we are in establishing natives with these two different methods. So how do we measure our success? So, so um, we're scientists, so we're always trying to collect data to find out um, what's working and what's not. So I mentioned we did some baseline surveys on plants and bumblebees, but we're also doing a bunch of other surveys to measure how successful we are. And again, we're fortunate to be working with Virginia Working Landscapes and with the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation. These were two of our uh, great students from last summer 
collecting plant data and insect data. You can see Jared has a, a gasoline powered suction there. It's like a leaf blower that runs backwards with a penny hose on the front. And um, he's sucking bugs out of the field to, to quantify what bugs were found in the field before we did any of our restoration treatments. And then you can see Jordan is engulfed by the persicaria. So it's, yeah, you know, it can be 100 degrees out there. It's, it's a really challenging place to work. So we are really grateful for their help. And this just gives you an idea of the points where we're sampling for insects and plants. So at 10 points in each of the plots, so about 80 points. Um, we're also interested in soils, as I've alluded to a little bit. So it's not just the plants and the insects. Um, and we did quite a few baseline soil tests, again, um, with the help of volunteers. Um, we were interested in the fungi to bacteria ratio and the microbial species diversity and also the overall soil health that um, uh, variables like total carbon and nitrogen. And we did soil sampling in fescue fields, the ones that are restoration sites. And we also sampled at uh, Piedmont Prairie remnants to look at, to see if there were differences. Um, and we found more fungi, such as mycorrhizae, um, and less bacteria at native Piedmont prairies than in fescue fields. So we found a huge difference actually um, in terms of the microbes that are in the soils in native prairies versus exotic. We also found more species of bacteria and fungi and more predators. So it was an overall more complicated uh, system uh, with more predators because there was more to eat. So there's more biomass of microbes and more predators there to eat them. And now for a slightly complicated graph. And you don't have to think too much about this. So basically, if the points are close to each other, then they're similar. And so you can see the green squares are native prairies. Um, and that means that they have a similar soil fauna uh, to each other. Then we have the blue dots and the orange squares. Those are basically indistinguishable. That's Oak Spring and Clifton. And then um, the red triangles are at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. So those are all fescue fields but the SCBI fescue fields are the most different from the native Piedmont prairies. And this is a principal components analysis that combines all 27 of those soil variables. So this is a way of looking at the general similarity uh, with these different communities. So we can see again that the native prairies have totally different microbes and we are gonna be tracking how this changes over time. So we're hoping that as the community, as the plants shift back to natives that the soils will also follow. Um, but the alternative possibility is that the soils are so degraded at some of these sites that they won't be able to support a good native community. So we'll see if maybe that's one of the constraints on establishing natives. Okay, and briefly to mention the potential role of cattle in, in all of this, another contentious topic. Um, so I mentioned we, we had cows on both sides, we removed them from the southern side, and we still have cattle on the northern 90 acres. And one thing we observed um, almost you know, within a year and a half is that we had lost some of our key birds from the site where we removed the cattle. So we had an unintended consequence. So grasshopper sparrows and meadowlarks last summer were pretty rare in the southern pasture, whereas they were abundant um, right up to 50,000. So, so immediately we're thinking maybe there is something to uh, having cattle. You know, and it's, it's probably just a function of the height of the grass. So you could go out there and mow it repeatedly. Um, but first of all, that costs money. You have to use fossil fuels to do it. Um, you're disrupting the nesting birds um, when you're mowing. Um, maybe cattle, you know, could do a better job, save you some trouble, and uh, you still have to investigate that. So why do we care about grasshopper sparrows? So um, they, they are found in short grass fields in our region. And unfortunately, they're declining really fast. So you can see about a half percent annual decline across most of their range. So they're really crashing. Um, and so anything we can do to help grasshopper sparrows breed successfully is a good thing to do. And as I mentioned, there seems to be um, evidence that cattle could play a role in um, grassland biodiversity in our region. But we are working with collaborators to collect some data on this to find out. Um, so one of the projects we're working on is um, measuring nesting success and pastures of different grazing intensities. Um, so the thought here is that if you have a low stocking rate, not that many cattle in a field, you might be able to keep the grass short enough for the birds that need short grass, 
without causing a bunch of negative consequences like sitting on nests or rubber grazing and making the habitat unsuitable um, and having negative consequences for the native plants. We're also studying American kestrels. Um, so we're going to be putting GPS tags on about 20 kestrels next summer to learn what sort of habitats they use for foraging um, and how that is related to their nest success. So we have them nesting in nest boxes here and at several properties around the region. This is another bird that seems to do really well in cattle pastures. Um, so we're going to be collecting more information on that. And we just got the good news that the John Marshall Soil and Water Conservation District will be supporting um, a big project uh, in our cattle pasture. We're going to be excluding our cattle from the streams and setting up paddocks for rotational grazing so that we can, again, uh, mitigate the negative impacts of cattle while hopefully using them for our biodiversity goals. Um, and again, if we zoom in on the northern pasture, I'll show you briefly what that looks like. So we're going to be excluding them from the streams, like I said, with those red fences um, and creating this is a map of four paddocks. We're probably going to end up creating more like seven paddocks. We're going to be planting natives in some of them, and the others are going to stay as cool season uh, fields. But we're moving the cows around to mimic how the bison would mob graze an area um, to again hopefully um, have some positive effects. And then the question again is should we even put cows back sometimes um, back into the native restoration site? And this is, you know, we don't have to come up with an answer to this question for several years because we're still uh, just getting into this experiment and we're going to see what's working and what's not. But eventually we probably will put cows back at a very low stocking rate in some of those fields um, to see how they affect the native species that we're trying to help. Um, and again, I mean, uh, cattle are not going away anytime soon in our region. And if there's a way that we can improve how cattle are managed um, to, so that native biodiversity don't suffer, then that would be a real positive outcome. Okay, Piedmont Prairies, to close it out. So now we go back to the beginning. So this is uh, my neighbor's field. So um, unfortunately, you know, the one acre field that I had was basically dominated by fescue and not much there in terms of natives. But it turns out that my, that my neighbor had some really great stuff. So the grass is really is browner here on the other side, you know, um, which is a good thing. So you can see this is Indian grass and little blue stem. These are the two uh, uh, key components of a Piedmont prairie. Um, so it turned out that my neighbor had a really cool field um, right next door. And so I started thinking about what do people have in their fields without actually planting stuff. And so I got to nosing around more in my neighbor's field and I started noticing flowers as well. So pasture thistle, mountain mint, uh, mist flower, wild bergamot. These are some of the things that we're planting, working really hard to try to establish in our plantings. But my neighbor had all of these flowers without doing anything other than mowing it once a year. And he even had a lot of other cool things like a couple of orchid species, skullcap, butterfly weed, Maryland golden master, lobelias. It, it really was a beautiful, amazing field and he had never planted anything. And then I started looking at work. Okay, so surely, you know, my neighbor's property isn't that special. So let's look at other places. And it turned out that the Clifton Institute also had an old field that was a cattle pasture in the 70s. And since then, it had just been uh, mowed annually, um, every one to three years, actually. Um, and it turned out that it had a bunch of really cool things as well. Dominated by natives, very few exotics, um, slender lespedes, uh, early goldenrod, Indian grass. So I've got thinking about this more and um, looked into it. And there have been some surveys uh, by Gary Fleming and others on uh, Piedmont prairies in our area, but there have been no comprehensive vegetation surveys. <laughs> so we came up with some questions. What are the plants that are characteristic of these habitats? What is the status of these grasslands in our region? Um, are they declining? Are there rare plants that are found there that we need to help? And, you know, for restoration, a very applied question, when should we plant seeds versus when should we not do anything to a field? I think this is a really important question. I've already alluded to it that in some fields, um, there may actually be some really interesting plants that are worth saving. And you could be counterproductive by killing off a field and then planting it with a wildflower mix. 
And when it does come time to plant, what species should we be planting? And this is, you know, will be informed directly on what we find in these northern Piedmont prairies. So in thinking a little bit about um, how these prairies came about, I mentioned briefly that they were maintained by fire. Um, if you look at fire scars on trees and if you look at climate data, you can come up with a, a model, and that's what these folks did in 2012, which predicts that um, we had fires here from 1650 to 1850, about every four to six years. And if you get an intense fire that frequently, that's um, enough to maintain a grassland. And so to me, that is a pretty good explanation of um, where these plants came from. So nobody ever planted those wonderful flowers at Clifton or at my neighbor's field. And that's because there was this, um, there were fires um, started by lightning strikes. And there was also uh, grazing by bison, um, which um, caused significant disturbance. There's no doubt that bison were in the Shenandoah Valley and in the southern Piedmont. There, there's, it's not for sure they were here. Some range maps show them as being here in the northern Piedmont. Um, I don't think we're ever going to know. But as you can imagine, we don't have intense fires that cover the entire landscape every four to six years anymore. And that's good for people, but bad for grassland plants. Um, so grasslands have nearly disappeared from the Piedmont as a result of fire suppression and forest going back, plowing up fields for crops, invasion of cool season pasture grasses like fescue and other non-natives, and of course, urban development. But if we wanna look at the history, so um, try to get a clue, you know, on where these habitats would have been, um, you can look at some old maps from explorers like this one from 1670, and you can see it says Carolina, and here it says Virginia. And it's kind of a weird angle, but basically this is our region. And here it says Savannah. And that is apparently the Shenandoah Valley. And so in 1670, the Shenandoah Valley was a big, at least that part of it was a Savannah. And the yellow arrow shows some stippling here that apparently means that there was a small grassland there at the headwaters of the Rappahannock River. Um, so that's right in our neighborhood. So in 1670, at least, there were some of these habitats in our area. And then this is just a cool image that the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative put out. And you can see that, of course, there was a lot of plowing and um, uh, row crops that were put in. But you can see they left a roadside strip of native prairie grasses. And so when you're driving down the road and you see um, wildflowers, sometimes those actually it, there potentially could be an ancient uh, Hello. Hello. The guy's got sunglasses on. Somebody needs to move their on. And here's an artillery mm -hmm. piece, and you're wondering how in the world did this get into a talk about grasslands? Um, but this is how some of our best grasslands in our area are maintained, are by fires that are set by artillery and other military exercises. Great to think about, but it's the truth. So at Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania, Fort Pickett and Quantico, all three of these sites are active military bases where fires were set, um, were and are set um, during military exercises. And those frequent fires have led to the persistence of some really important habitats. So Pennsylvania, they still have Regal fritillaries, which is a beautiful butterfly that used to be across the Piedmont and the East. Um, now it's pretty much only there and in the Midwest. Um, um, and you can see that nowadays, they, you know, they have a whole staff of biologists at Fort Indian Town Gap, and it's still an active uh, base, but they're managing it for biodiversity. So they do prescribe burns now to get exactly the kind of fire that they want. And that's what's happening in this photo. They're dropping flaming ping pong balls at the helicopters um, to create habitat for that rare butterfly and rare plants. Some local examples of Piedmont prairies. Um, one of the nicest ones is in a, this power line clearing on private land south of Culpeper. Um, that'll be one of our survey sites this summer. Um, this other one is an old field um, in Prince William County with stiff goldenrod. That's a state rare plant. It's only found in a, um, a handful of sites now in Virginia. And so you might say, well, these Piedmont prairies, you know, they're just anthropogenic habitats. They're only maintained because we're out there mowing or we're grazing. Um, and if people weren't here, they would be gone. And they're just the result of deforestation and they're probably not very important. 
Um, but that's not the case. It, definitely not the case with the southern Piedmont prairies. So this is a photo of Difficult Creek Natural Area Preserve, which had the single most diverse vegetation plot in the entire state of Virginia. So 180 species of plants in a 10 by 10 meter plot. Um, so it's just amazing diversity of plants found there. Very diverse and with a bunch of rare and threatened species. So 52 imperiled species of plants are found in Piedmont prairies and rock outcrops in Virginia, which is the number one um, habitat category in the state. So these habitats are, are really important, but they don't receive um, their fair share of attention. And here in Northern Virginia, we have at least four rare plants found in these Piedmont prairies. The Torres Mountain Mint is imperiled globally. It's um, supposedly only known from 20 sites in the world. Um, I think it might be a little more widespread than that, but that's a, that is a really rare plant. Um, and it's found in a couple of our survey sites that we're gonna be surveying this summer. The early false foxglove was once found in Prince William County, um, but that site has now been developed and it's gone from the state. The stiff goldenrod is state rare and so is American blue hearts. So all four of these were, are, well three are and one was, um, a characteristic rare plant of Northern Piedmont Prairie. So again, um, we are launching a, a project to do vegetation surveys in these habitats. We are characterizing the diversity and composition of plants in the prairies. We're identifying threats. Um, and we've already observed some of those. So that Arthraxon hispidus joint head grass, I've seen it taking over um, Deep Cut, which is one of the nicest prairies around. It's in Manassas Battlefield Park, and it's being engulfed. The natives there are being engulfed by Arthraxon hispidus. So that's clearly a threat. Um, urban development is going to be a problem too. We're also going to be comparing soil chemistry and microbes um, in intact and degraded prairies, continuing on the research from last year. And we're going to be doing this at about 30 sites, assuming that everything works out with the virus. Um, it looks like we can still access most of these sites for this project. Uh, and you see that the project so far spans from Fairfax down to Orange County. Okay, what to do, so to save these sites. First of all, raising awareness. So a lot of people don't even know we have grassland remnants hiding out in power line clearings and military bases, roadsides, old fields that are mowed once a year. Um, they're out there and there are important plants living in these places and insects as well. And birds too, I didn't mention the birds, grasshopper sparrows. We're gonna be discussing um, our findings and possible management solutions um, with property owners and managers. We're gonna be hopefully helping people coordinate how to control invasive plants in these sites. And we are probably do some uh, emergency seed collection as well. We, are, we already did a lot of seed collection last fall, actually, um, for some of these rare plants. Um, and we're probably maybe stepping that up in the future if we can find some volunteers to help us uh, take care of the seedlings. It's a big job. And then this picture is interesting. It's from Arkansas. And what happened here was that this prairie was, um, gonna, was subject to imminent development. So they were about to go in and, I don't know, put a shopping mall or something on top of this prairie. And so they had no other option but to take a sod cutter and roll up the prairie and move it to another site. Um, and they did that and they actually didn't lose any species. So they had all the species that they were working on, you know, I forget, they had 10 priority plants or something. And when they rolled them up and moved them somewhere else, they were all still there. So it was successful. Of course, not very practical, pretty expensive. You gotta find another piece of land. This is the absolute last ditch. Um, uh, so we're gonna avoid that at all costs, but something to at least think about. Okay, so to conclude. First of all, you can make a difference for native plants and animals on the property of any size. So, you know, I have a one acre field and like I said, I attracted American bumblebees. But even if you have a really small area, it always helps just to plant a couple of natives. Um, if you're going to plant anything, plant an oak tree. That'll be a host plant for hundreds of species of moth. Some fescue fields support important biodiversity. So, um, like I said, they're often considered to be biological deserts, but they're often a mixed bag. And so, you know, you've got good stuff and you've got bad stuff out there. And the trick really is to give the upper hand to the good stuff. The seed bank is potentially your friend. You may not need to plant anything. Think about what you're planting. Um, try to make it as uh, similar as you can um, while meeting your other goals like aesthetics. 
conventional and organic methods each have their pros and cons, so it's not a simple decision. It appears that cattle can play a role in biodiversity conservation um, in our region. And finally, Piedmont prairies are diverse and threatened. Oh, and okay, before I, before I uh, stop talking, uh, resources for wildflower meadows. Um, so this is a list, I mean, we're recording this talk and we'll be putting this up on the web so you can, you can look at it later. But basically this is a list of resources for where to find seeds and plants, where to get advice and find funding. Thank you very much. So um, I have not been monitoring the chat, but if people just want to shout out their questions, that's I have Eleanor has the questions written down. Hi everyone. So okay. if anybody has one, shout it out, but otherwise um, maybe can I go through my list? Sure. Okay. So I've written, I've been writing down questions as we go. Um, so Christina asked. Didn't you worry about killing amphibians using Roundup? Yeah, so I, I guess I went through it pretty fast, the list of pros and cons with herbicides versus organics. Um, and killing amphibians is definitely one of the main problems with herbicide. Um, if you're using glyphosate, um, you don't want to have it near water, um, usually. So if you're using Roundup, the surfactants in Roundup are one of the big problems for using herbicides near water. But there are aquatic versions of, of a glyphosate that you can use in your water bodies. But in our case, I mean, we're working on dry meadows and we just avoid the water courses. We've, we have a huge buffer, so we don't spray herbicide anywhere near water. Um, and then Roundup, you know, has a bad, bad reputation, but it does um, break down really fast in the soil. So it doesn't travel very far. Um, so I think it's justified what we did. But and again, um, there are, you know, organics are not, um, totally positive. So if you're in there plowing up all the soil, you're probably going to be ruining the, um, the microbes in the soil and all the ground nesting bees. And so it's, we just have to think, think about the consequences of everything that we do. All right, Ellen asked, I just burned my own two thirds acre and stilt grass is coming up everywhere. What now? That's a great question. Yeah, so stilt grass, I think everybody has a question about stilt grass. Um, well, it sounds kind of similar to what we were experiencing where we got rid of the fescue and then it created an opportunity for the annuals. Um, and still grass, what you want to do is you want to wait and mow it in like July or August. So you want to let it get as tall as it gets. You want to get pretty tall and before it starts to flower, then you mow it. And it's an annual grass. So if you do that, um, then you have a chance that it's not going to then grow another few inches tall and then flower and seed. And if you're able to you know, keep it from setting seed, then that's good. And there are a lot of seeds in the soil, so you're gonna to have to do it for years to try to get rid of it. But that's one thing you can do, is mow it at the right time of year. And then there are also annual grass specific herbicides that you can spray that will only hurt the, the still grass and annual grasses without hurting anything else. Okay, Christina asked if using grazing for maintenance, how often is appropriate? And she's asking about the pen cattle that can be consumed with them. How big of a piece of land is that? Oh. Maybe she can tell us. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, I don't think there's a good answer to that question. Um, oh, she said one acre. One acre, 10 cows. That's a lot of cows for one acre. I mean, I think this, the, the general rule is two acres per cow-calf pair is, is the sort of the you know, suggested stocking rate. Um, but you know, and if you just have one acre there, you're not gonna be trampling grasshopper sparrows and stuff. So I think, I mean, I think in with a piece of land that little, you, you want to you know, think about what the goals are. And if you're not hurting your pollinators or whatever you're trying to accomplish out there, then you're probably doing the right thing. But you know, a lower stocking rate is always better. Christina also asked, what cover crop will we use in the discount pack? Yeah, so um, we use different cover crops in the summer and in the winter. And the summer cover crop is going to be buckwheat, and the winter is going to be probably rye, winter rye. Mike asked about the principal components graph. Um, any idea about native fields with herbicide versus natives without? So I guess the first thing to clarify is that the native fields in that graph, in that graph were not created 
native grasslands. Those are all remnants of old native grasslands. So there's nothing about that in that graph specifically, but maybe do you have any idea about how the microbiota would be affected by herbicides or not? So uh, yeah, I probably I shouldn't have gone through that uh, pros and cons table so fast because I think that is another concern. There's some research that shows that herbicides have negative consequences for the microbes in the soil. And we're going to be measuring that in this project, all three of our sites. And that's definitely a potential negative effect of using herbicides. Um, but again, but plowing is also potentially bad for the soil uh, microbes. So we'll see. But yeah, but so the native prairies were remnants that have never been planted. So that's kind of that's kind of the gold standard. That's what we're headed towards. We want to get the microbes to be similar to those native prairie remnants. All right, Jennifer asks, what does it mean to roll the ground with a lawn roller? So can you describe that tool? So, um, so you can pull a cultipacker behind a tractor or you can pull a roller behind a tractor. But what I did, since I had such a small field, it's just a big uh, drum um, that you push around and you fill it with water, that's it. And so what should people Google if they want to buy one? Lawn roller. I guess people roll their lawn. I don't know why. <laughs> Jennifer also asked, how do you measure the pollen contribution of different plants? That was Dave Carr's work. Yeah, so, I, so they captured the bees and collected the pollen and looked at it under the microscope. And then they can identify the plant by looking at the pollen. So th these plants have really different looking pollen. So you can get it to, down to the genus level. Like you can tell a goldenrod from a, from a pine tree, but you can't tell the species of goldenrod apart. But, but a goldenrod pollen grain looks really different from a pine grain. So at the end of your discussion of our property, Carolyn asked, if you were to pick just three to five native plants that did well in our backfield, what were they? And it depends on the soil moisture and the sun. Um, but you know, if you have a dry, sunny place, um, narrow leaf mountain mint is a really great one. Um, that's one that I've had more success with seedlings than with seeds. But once you get a seedling, it's they're they're really rock solid. The deer don't eat them. They don't get out competed by other plants, and they're real magnets for pollinators. So narrow leaf mountain mint is a good one, and it doesn't spread as much as the other mountain mints. Um, it's yeah, it's just it's impossible to come up with just five. I mean. Eleanor will tell you that I have all these seedlings that I can't let a single one die. Um, and it depends on what you're going for. But another one that I've had good luck with is the world rosinweed, which is a silphium. And that one um, from seed established really well in that field. And so it outcompeted all the bad stuff. It can be like 10 feet tall though, um, but it's, these, it's like a sunflower and that's a really great one. In the moister areas, we had swamp uh, verbena, blue vervain is the other name. And that established really well from seeds as well. Yeah. yeah. But you know, with that kind of stuff, I mean, send me an email and if you, you know, can tell me a little more about your site, like how dry it is, how sunny it is, um, I can give you recommendations. Jennifer asked, are seeds of the foxglove available or the other rare flowers that you mentioned? So there's no Virginia seed of the foxglove available. Um, you may be able to get it elsewhere. I think it's not a very common plant anywhere, actually. The Torrey's Mountain Mint is the globally rare one, and that is not available commercially usually, but we sold, um, we sold about 10 of them this year. We collected seeds from them in the fall, and we sold some seedlings. Stiff Goldenrod, you can buy from Earth Sanga in Fairfax. Um, and the Blue Hearts, I'm not aware of any source of that. Good question though. Tess asked, what's the best time of year to burn? Um, and do you want to burn every year or alternating with mowing or what's the schedule? Yeah, so the best, the best, the, let's see, the easiest time to burn is from January to March. <clears throat> and so when we have cold and dry weather um, and you want a day, I mean, you pick your weather very carefully, but that's the easiest time when it's easier to control the fires when they burn well. <clears throat> um, but if you want to mimic the natural disturbance, it's probably better to actually burn in like August. But then it's tricky because you might get really dry weather, hot weather, the potential for the fire to escape. So basically, every, pretty much everybody does their burns at that early spring, late winter um, <clears throat> time frame. And the frequency is uh, another complicated question. So we are going to be burning or mowing our fields um, every year at Clifton. 
to maintain grasslands. Um, but you can also, you know, my backfield, you can, we've mowed it like half of it, we mow it every three years and the other one we burn every other year. And we still, we're not getting that many woody plants taking over and that's working out okay. Cause it's small scale and I can go out and cut the woody plants with whoppers and stuff. But what, you know, it depends on what you're going for. If you want a grassland, you probably, in our region, you're probably gonna, have, and it's a big grassland, you're gonna have to disturb it every year probably. Um, if you want to shrub your habitat for prairie warblers and stuff, you can get away with doing it every three to five years. Um, Deborah asked, she says she's currently attempting organic transformation of seven acres. Our first cover crop of winter wheat still has fescue. Any recommendations for next steps? Okay, what's happened so far? She, the first cover crop of winter wheat still has fescue. Yeah, well, I, I guess I don't know how many times you sprayed it. So like, um, she says she's trying organic. Oh, you're trying organic. So how did you prepare it? How did I mean? Come back to yeah, maybe she can tell us how you uh, how you prepared it. Did you disc it or something? Jared commented that he uses a lawn roller to flatten the earth because it's invasive earthworms live in hummocks of soil. Very cool. Um, Tim asked, is there an optimal strategy to establish a baseline for flora in a section of land? Well, um, in our case, we were really lucky and the Virginia Native Plant Society sent volunteer botanists out here and helped us do our surveys. Um, you know, I'm learning my plants, but I still have a long way to go with things like sedges. And um, so there's a, you know, if you, want, if you want to really get inventory, you have to get a true expert to come and help you out. Um, and it just depends on how far you want to go. I mean, if you, and it also depends on how big the property is, how, how many different kinds of habitats you have. Um, there are different options. Um, but yeah, if you can send me an email, I can help you out with that one. Okay, I think last question. Um, I just, Melissa says, I just purchased 62 acres. How can I get my property evaluated for native species? I'm interested in cultivating a meadow. Yeah, so, um, and that is related to the last question too, which is great. So one option is to talk to the forestry department. They're, they are a good resource. Um, the private lands biologists are fantastic. They are really knowledgeable. Um, they can really, that's like, this is their cup of tea. Like they can come and look at your meadow and, and give you advice on what to do. Um, the problem is that there are not very many of them and they're really busy, but it's worth a try. So Justin Folks could, could help you out. And also if you're close by, I could help you out. Um. Deborah says she plowed this planted in the fall of 2019. Yeah, so I think what people often try with the organics is that they just um, disc it or plow it once or twice. And it seems like that's not enough. So you plow it once and you get rid of the fescue, but then it ends up coming back or other nasty stuff comes back. So that's why we're trying to do it. We're going to do it six times. So we're going to really hit it hard. Um, and use the smother crops. But you know, in your case, if you've already done it, you, um, you've already planted your cover crop, you know, maybe that smother crop will help take care of some of the weeds, but you might consider doing it, plowing it a few more times before you plant any natives. Because once you plant the natives, then you're really, you're stuck, you know, you, you can't really do the control. Okay, I think we'll make this, maybe one last question. Okay, one last question, sure. Brianna and Trevor ask, can you explain the difference between tall and short grass fields? Yeah, I mean, um, it's just the height of the species. So I think um, uh, tall fescue and orchard grass, even if you let them grow, they don't get that tall. And that tends to be good habitat for a lot of these species that are declining, even though those are non-native species, non-native grasses. So like uh, grasshopper sparrows and bobolinks and stuff do pretty well actually in these cool season fields. Um, but you know, yeah. It's kind of a hard question to answer because I mean, some of the native Piedmont prairies have pretty short grass. They're dominated by a little blue stem, and those tend to be the poorer sites where it's really dry and rocky. Whereas moister or better soils tend to have Indian grass, and that can be like head high. And so we actually have both short and tall in our area. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And we're going to um, put the recording up in the next couple of days. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Bye.